Hello everyone, this is Nathan P. Butler, and this is my Star Wars blog, The Voice of Reason or Lack Thereof. We're doing something a little different this time. We're actually going to be looking at questions that were submitted about my project known as the Star Wars Timeline Gold. This is the culmination of the Star Wars Timeline project with its newest release being released today, October 17, 2017. Uh, this is number 55, the 84th overall release, but since it became the Star Wars Timeline Gold, this is number 55, at over 3,200 pages across five documents. And uh, because we're hitting that 20th anniversary of that project, the thought was, hey, let's do a Q&A, but let's do it specifically about the timeline rather than about everything, of course, that is out there. So we're going to dive in here, get some of those kind of Q&A questions out of the way. And if you have other questions about this, feel free to put your Q&A questions underneath this video, and perhaps at some point I'll do another Q&A or maybe a section of a Q&A that focuses specifically on the Star Wars Timeline Gold. And you can find the Star Wars Timeline Gold at StarWarsFanWorks.com slash timeline. All right, so let's do this, and pardon me if I squint. I'm reading the questions off my screen, and wow, I must be getting older than I thought I was. Well, I guess if it's 20 years of the Star Wars Timeline Project, and I started it when I was a senior in high school, I am actually getting old. Uh, the 20th anniversary of this is actually my 38th birthday, so two more years to 40, and I'm sure people bringing a black cake and black balloons and that sort of thing. But uh, let's stick to the questions, not my impending uh, seniority here. So we have a question here from John Landau who asks, how in the blank, and he does say blank, how in the blank do you have all this time to read, watch, and listen, as well as podcast and make videos while holding down a full-time job and keeping the entire timeline gold up to date. Um, well, I think I've said before that uh, one of the things that makes me able to do this type of thing is the fact that for me, stress relief needs to be something active. I'm not usually big on the idea of just kind of sitting down and watching TV or sitting down, watching a movie, flipping through Netflix, whatever. Um, for me, the biggest stress relief is some part of a creative kind of process. So in a lot of ways, working on the Star Wars Timeline Gold, uh, podcasting with Mark for Star Wars Beyond the Films, with Michael for Cloud City Casino, doing interviews for other podcasts about things like my book, A Saga on Home Video, available on Amazon, blah, blah, blah. Um, doing that kind of thing or doing the videos doesn't really feel like work. It just feels like fun. It's a hobby. It's a stress relief. You know, if I'm stressed from work, I could then work on the timeline and somehow that feels like I'm easing the pressure, not just putting more pressure on myself. Um, I am sort of blessed in the sense that my job affords me a lot of flexibility because uh, up until, I mean, really, I guess it was, what, three years ago or so now, um, I taught for 12 and a half years in a traditional brick-and-mortar, regular physical face-to-face -face kind of school. And I was good at what I did, but I was also really worn down a lot of times after going through an entire day because you'd get up and, you know, you'd be at the school building by a little bit after 7. Um, classes would start at about 8.30 or so. You'd go all the way up until uh, after 3 o'clock, uh, closer to 4. And then a lot of times you'd have meetings or you'd have a duty before school or after school. We used to joke uh, after school that we had the sexist duty because anytime they thought there was going to be a fight, it was all male personnel. Please report to the bus ramp. And I'm thinking... Yeah, I'm male, but there are women in the building that were like three times as large as me. They could probably stop a fight better than I could, even if the policy wasn't, if there's a fight, stand off to the side and say in a stern voice, stop it, stop it, break it up, stop it, so you don't jump in and wind up getting sued. Um, but, like, my days were sucked up by work, because you may only be working about an eight-hour job, but you had all the time before it getting ready, so you really didn't have much of the morning. And then the afternoons and evenings, a lot of times you were grading things or you were doing lesson plans for the next day. So my time was really getting sort of sucked up. I was still making time for my projects, but it was very much sort of an opportunity cost type of thing, speaking as an econ teacher. One thing being give up to have time for another. Now I'm in the position of being a full-time online teacher. Uh, our county has this innovative program where we have local full-time teachers teaching courses who can actually go out to the schools and visit the students when they need it, um, check in with them, check in with the counselor's offices in person as needed, and that sort of thing. 
but we use a platform, an LMS they call it, a learning management system called Edgenuity. And Edgenuity delivers most of the content, most of the direct instruction, and we are there to sort of monitor things, check in with students, help when there are misunderstandings, help guide them um, in a lot of ways, sort of dealing with those who in a traditional classroom a lot of time would be sort of left behind because if everybody else is getting it, the lesson moves on the next day, and yet these kids could be sitting there still needing assistance. So we're able to sort of focus on those that need it more and sort of meet kids where they are knowledge-wise. Um, but with that being something that is online, my days have changed. Now I start at 8 in the morning, but I end not until 8 at night. But it's not a consistent straight through thing. It depends on when students are more active. Um, between 8 and 8 on a weekday or on a school day, we're expected to respond within a three-hour turnaround time, which does give some flexibility. Um, yes, I do still check on things for my students after hours and on the weekends. I think all of us do um, that are part of the program. But the flexibility it provides allows us to meet those students' needs, but also have more flexibility in terms of our own time. Like, uh, you'll see me sometimes doing YouTube live streams of uh, PlayStation VR games and stuff like that, usually right around about 3.30 or right around about 5 o'clock or so, because a lot of times that's when students are either on the bus on the way home and nobody's online, really, or they're just getting home and they don't want to mess with it right now. They're just eating their dinner or snacking or whatever. Um, so the day sort of fluctuates, and days can differ, but a lot of times it allows me to sort of work on this stuff and do work at the same time. Like as I'm recording this, on my screen right next to me, or on my two screens right next to me, as a pair of monitors hooked up to a, a dock, and I've got all my work stuff pulled up. And right now, I know that we're at a lull point in the day, but I still have it up to check on students. I still have my phones, uh, my phone and my work phone set on vibrate, sitting down right next to my foot. So if something comes through there that doesn't show up on this screen, I can easily you know, stop recording for a second, check it out, then jump back in. Um, the flexibility that provides is helpful. Um, but I do have three jobs for the county. I am a full-time online teacher. I am also a, the lead virtual coach for the teacher induction program. I'm also a curriculum architect for government. So I have part-time things that I do alongside all of this stuff. Um, but I'm able to use that flexibility and the fact that I just don't like to sit there doing nothing. So when others might sit back, kick it back for the day, and watch some TV, I might turn on the TV off to the side, but I'm working on something. You know, I just, it's, it's kind of what I do. I'm sure my wife doesn't always appreciate it, but that just kind of is how I relieve stress. Um, so that gives me time to read and that sort of thing. Um, what I'm finding with the reading is, though, that that's probably the toughest part from a time standpoint. Um, I read fairly quickly, just like I type fairly quickly. But um, usually what I used to do before I was married, before my wife lived with me or anything like that, um, I used to read a lot before I went to bed. And I would just leave the light on, read a regular physical book, and then put it up and turn the light out. Well, now I can't do that because she needs to sleep also. So what tends to happen is I'll be reading on my Kindle. I've got a Kindle Paperwhite, um, which is lit. So basically you can read at night without having a separate reading light. But I tend to still get my Star Wars books because I want them for my collection. I still get them in physical form. So the one type of book I don't wind up being able to read like that at night is the Star Wars books. I'm actually hoping that maybe with the Patreon, if that winds up getting up to a level that I can financially support it, I may wind up uh, getting ebook copies also, specifically so that I can read more quickly through them um, by reading some at night. Like, that's how I got through the Silmarillion. Yes, my first J.J.R.R. Uh, Tolkien book that I ever read all the way through was the freaking Silmarillion. I'm crazy. I'm reading The Hobbit that way right now. It's how I reread all the Dresden files recently. Um, so for me... It's a matter of just being fortunate with my time and just being very proactive with trying to be efficient with the time. But still, I don't have time for everything I'd like to do. Like, I would have loved to, for the 2017 edition, have gotten uh, all the updates to the Old Republic onto the timeline. But I didn't have time to do it because of everything else that was going on. So uh, it's, it's a little bit of everything. To me, it always feels like I still want more time that I just don't have. But I could see how someone could look at it and go, my God, man, how do you pull it off? It also helps with the podcasting that, uh, unlike in years past, I don't do any of the editing for the podcast anymore. Um, so in essence, for the podcast, I just meet with Mark for a couple hours, meet with Michael for a couple of hours, record, I'm done, and either Michael's editing it, uh, Michael Morris, that is, is editing, or the other Michael, Michael Yankovic, uh, is editing for Beyond the Films. So 
that takes some of that off my hands uh, as well. All right. So thank you for the question, John. I'm sure that was way more than you ever wanted to know for uh, an answer to that question, but hopefully uh, it was enlightening, maybe, kind of, possibly. Let's see. Uh, Christine Anderson asks two questions, which are, uh, first, what has been your favorite part of working on the timeline? Um, I'd, I'd say a couple of things. Uh, one is just all the doors that it's opened. Um if I hadn't been doing the timeline, I probably never would have gotten into podcasting because my first podcast, Chrono Radio, was designed kind of as sort of a supplement to the timeline gold, not as a separate thing in and of itself, and just grew from there. And then I've been in podcasting. This is my 15th anniversary in podcasting also. Um, I started that in uh, 2002, uh, the day that Attack of the Clones came out, right before, so right after I graduated college and, or for undergrad and right before I moved down to the Atlanta area. Um it opened the door to being able to write for Star Wars Tales, which gave me the confidence to get into other writing, like writing with Grail Quest books for wars and uh, self-publishing and then a, uh, professionally publishing Greater Good. Um, if that hadn't built up, if I hadn't had like an audience sort of slowly building from the podcast and the timeline and everything, I can't imagine I ever would have written this book. And I'm really proud of this and really excited to continue with new editions and add more to it as new Star Wars films get released on home video. Um, all those doors kind of got opened by me working on the timeline. I don't know that I would have reached a point of being able to do any of them, or at least not as early as I did, um, without it. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing, though, I would say um, is sort of the, um, the, the mystery-solving aspect of it all, right? So you wind up with stuff like, say, the Thrawn novel. And the Thrawn novel pisses me off because the Thrawn novel covers about a five to six year period through a bunch of time jumps in the first two thirds or so of the book. And then the last third or so of the book is all right before season three of Rebels. But there's an undetermined time gap in between. And we have a situation where basically um, we don't know exactly when it starts. We know that it starts between Tarkin and A New Dawn somewhere. But that means it starts anywhere from 14 BBY to 11 BBY. So a lot of figuring out how to place that on the timeline is sort of a sleuthing effort, right? Where you're looking for references to things. You're looking for um, things that it ties into. I mean, even Timothy Zahn and the story group have said they have no idea exactly when Thrawn starts. They're leaving it vague so they can shift it around as they need to, which again pisses me off. Um, but in the end, it comes down to a judgment call of how to place it. Um, so in that case, a lot of the placement came down to a uh, writer Azadi from Rebels. Um, if he really does wind up getting arrested and sent away because of his assistance to the Bridgers, then surely he must be arrested sometime relatively soon after the Bridgers are. We know the Bridgers are arrested in 12 BBY because Ezra was seven when it happened. So knowing that, then I was like, okay, well, here's the part where he gets arrested in the course of Thrawn. How can we fit it? Well, I can't fit it right after it in the same year because that would mean that the novel started before Tarkin, which is against the rules, apparently, because of how the timeline was set up. So I guess it'll be the next year, and I was able to lay it out that way. Same thing with the Phasma novel. The Phasma novel's present is never pinned down. Everything is 10 years before, 12 years before, 8 years before, 9 years before. But they don't actually pin down the present, so you don't know when those dates are actually dating back to. Um, and in that case... Pinning it down as best as I could came down to a reference at one point to the age of one of the side characters. Um, and then it turned out that there was also a reference to how that character and Phasma and Hux were all the same age. Uh, Armitage Hux were all the same age. And we actually knew because of a comment from Pablo Hidalgo on Twitter when Armitage Hux was supposedly born. And by doing that, we could pin down Phasma's birth date and Siv, I believe it was his birth date, and in doing so, the date of the present of the novel, and then all the dates behind it. Um, so it's it's fun to find solutions to stuff like that and suss it out when there are answers. What irks me is when I know, for instance, that the placement of Thrawn or the placement of Phasma that I came up with based on the sleuthing, that can be completely blown out of the water if at some point Lucasfilm decides to give us an actual date. And I actually would rather them say, here's what the actual date is, me have to say crap and move everything, than constantly have them leave it freaking vague. 
Um, but it's that sort of thing. And I think that figuring out the way that things would fit together and things like that was more fun, frankly, back with the Legends continuity. Because at least then they were pinning down things. You may not know when a book took place, but they did. Now, they don't even know because they're not willing to pin things down from time to time, um, which makes it very frustrating for those of us out there trying to put together some type of chronological thing. But I love the whole uh, you know, problem-solving aspect of it. Uh, did I ever expect to be doing this still in 2017, is the other thing she asked. God, no. Um, I don't know when it would have ended, but I could not have imagined a lot of the things that happened in the last 20 years, frankly. Um, I, heck, when it started, I would never have thought I would ever be leaving my hometown and living elsewhere, you know. Um, a lot of stuff took place in that 20 years. And I think that what has kept the project going is sort of the fandom need for it. Um, I could just as easily say I'm done and just work on other stuff. But what I found is over time, projects like this one that were trying to be as in-depth as this one were few and far between. The only one that really was similar in approach in terms of uh, doing summaries, and I actually think they did those well before I did, um, was Time Tales, which started around the same time, I believe. Um, but they started out with summaries. And... Then eventually Time Tales sort of fell by the wayside, and it's been gone for years. And there are other projects out there. Uh, Joe Bongiorno has a good one. Um, Rob Mullen has a good one, and so on. There's other people out there making timeline projects. Jim LaHane. Um, but nobody's got it as expansive as mine. And I can't imagine anybody would, because it took me 20 years. So at this point, it's kind of like, if I shut it down... Unless I find somebody who I trust enough to be able to continue it so that I could walk away and somebody else could still keep it going, I feel almost an obligation to keep it going as long as I can. Because otherwise the resource of this type of thing disappears from fandom. It's not just one of the things like it. It's the only thing quite like it. Um, and I want to make sure that it's still out there if at all possible, uh, both for their use and, heck, for my use as well. I mean, the thing started as something I was trying to just use for myself. Uh, back in, like, 1996 or so. It was only in 97, after being online on AOL for a little bit, that I realized other people might actually want copies of it and started to distribute the thing as uh, the Star Wars Timeline 1.0. That's why the anniversary is dated back to 2017 instead of... Uh, or 2017, to 1997 instead of 1996, is that in uh, 97, I started publicly distributing it. So... Um, I never would have expected it to have lasted this long. I don't know how long it's going to last. Um, but I kind of feel like if I can keep it going, I'm going to. And hell, if the canon reboot thing and the mess that is the Clone Wars back in 08 didn't cause me to say screw this and drop it, then maybe it's got a long life ahead of it still. We'll see. Uh, Steven Schinder asks, and it's not really specifically about the timeline, but he does ask, what are your favorite and least favorite theories about Snoke and or Rey? Um... I don't really have any favorites or least favorites, to be honest with you. I'd rather be surprised, and I'm betting that with all the theories that are out there, somebody's been right, but probably not entirely so. Um, what I would say my least favorite theories, though, are, and, and I'll say this, my wife's favorite theory on Snoke is that it's Ezra. I don't really have a theory. I'm betting that Snoke is just Snoke. Um, Ray. I don't know if we'll ever figure out who her parents are or know anything about them. But what bothers me, the theories that I hate, um, are when they make no logical sense, right? Like, I tell you, Ray and Kylo Ren are twins, even before we actually saw, you know, the birth scene stuff in Aftermath. Well, unless you can have twins that were born many years apart, that's wrong. No, man, uh, Ray is a secret love child of Obi-Wan. Well, unless he could have her years after he died, no. It's the nonsensical things that don't take into account uh, the age of Rey or anybody else they're trying to claim she's a twin or something with, or the ages and death times of the people that they're trying to claim were uh, uh, her parents. So that, to me, it's I, I love seeing theories. I love seeing the way that it's borne out. It's kind of curious to see, you know, what people think, and I'll be curious to see if any of them got it right. But... I'm again, I'm big on the whole intellectual honesty thing. If your theory is complete BS because none of your facts actually work and you're basically just ignoring the fact of when Ray was born or when Obi-Wan died to try to argue your theory, 
that's not intellectually honest. If anything, it's borderline idiocy. You know what I'm saying? Uh, let's see. Matthew Robinson uh, asks, uh, your thoughts on the change to Mandalorian culture over the years through the change of the EU to Legends and the writing style of the Clone Wars and Rebels teams uh, while bringing many fan-favorite EU characters back into the canon fold. Um, let's see. So I'm assuming this is just sort of like opinions on these things. Um, change to Mandalorian culture... Uh, I don't know. I think that it's frustrating what happened to Mandalorian culture with the Clone Wars. How they took something that was allowed to be very heavily developed and then threw a complete curveball in of having them be pretty much completely different than we were assuming that they were. Um, they eventually retconned it, uh, starting I think with the Essential Atlas actually. Um, they eventually retconned into this whole idea of, well, there was this war with the Jedi, and then there was a split, and, well, the warrior ones are kind of this thing, and the pacifistic ones are kind of this thing, and so on and so on. They sort of found a way to retcon it and make it work, but it's just like anything else with the Clone Wars cartoon series when Lucas was doing it. If only he had let them know ahead of time what his plans were, they wouldn't have gone in a different direction, and we wouldn't have wound up with clashes later. Um, that was why Lucas left the Clone Wars era completely off limits to writers from 1991 until 2002, or early 2002. It was only once we got around the time of Attack of the Clones and the marketing for it that he was like, yeah, sure, write some Clone Wars stuff, which they thought they could intricately plan out. And they did intricately plan out until in comes 2008 and shatters it all, uh, coming in like a wrecking ball, as uh, uh, Mark might say. So, frustrating. But I do like the fact that at least with this break of Legends and Canon, um, we now have, at least for Canon, consistency for the Mandalorians. Um, we don't have all the other stuff that I actually really, really love from Legends causing confusion with the way that Canon has decided to approach the Mandalorians. At least it's consistent. Um, and I'm liking what they're doing with trying to bring the Mandalorians back together um, in Rebels. So... Uh, where they go from here in Season 4 of Rebels, the final season of Rebels, will kind of determine whether or not it's all really paid off. Um, writing style of Clone Wars and Rebels teams, bringing back others. Um, I find that I very much like the way that Rebels is handled, the idea of sort of an ongoing story, these ongoing story arcs. They don't have to be uh, standalone episodes from time to time. They're not all jumbled in chronological order. Uh, whereas for the Clone Wars, I thought they did some pretty good writing as well at times. But I think Clone Wars, in a lot of ways, the issue was the way that... I mean, Lucas's way of telling stories in the Clone Wars reminds me of Marvel's way of making story decisions now, which is, hey, this sounds cool. Wouldn't that be awesome? Let's throw it up and see if it sticks, and we're just going to do it. Like, hey, how about we have one that's kind of like a story about nothing and like the artist Mobius and everything, and it'd be about death, and we could have them talk about suicide and stuff. Yeah, that's the ticket. Sunny Day in the Void and a whole arc built around it. Um, hey, I like monster movies. Zillow Beast. Kind of stuff. I get homages, but it seemed like it was just sort of a scattershot approach to trying to tell those stories, whereas at least with Rebels, there's a dedicated effort, and it seems like there is a plan to what they're doing. Uh, I made the comparison to Marvel because for Marvel, it seems like it's like, yeah, man, let's have Han, and we're going to say he was married. It won't be real. It'll be a sitcom kind of BS kind of turnaround, but let's claim that he was married, and let's make her black. That's big clickbait. Let's have a stormtrooper that uses a lightsaber and has, like, a specialized team with him. We'll call him Scar Squadron. How badass would that be? It's kind of stupid, really, but clickbait, baby. So for Lucas, it was whatever idea popped into his head, he was going to put on screen. For Marvel, it's whatever idea popped into their head they think they can use as clickbait, they will put in their comics right now. Um, so I think that, there, that there's much to be said for a much more planned out effort. Um, in essence, Rebels is to Clone Wars as Dark Horse comics were to the current Marvel comics. Much more well planned with ongoing arcs rather than weird standalone crap from time to time. Um, let's see. Uh, bringing fan-favorite EU characters back into the canon fold. I think that works as long as they're respectful to it. Like, I think it worked for Thrawn for the most part, but there are still people out there griping because, you know, Heir to the Empire isn't canon. Last Command isn't canon, and so forth. Um, depends on how they do it. 
If it's a very well-respected character who theoretically could exist in this alternate universe, right, because it is essentially two separate universes, uh, then go for it, as long as it's respectful. Unlike, for instance, how they did Quinlan Voss. Hey guys, we love the comics too. Look, it's Quinlan Voss. Yeah, he sounds like a beach bum and he's kind of an idiot, but it's Quinlan Voss. Aren't you happy? No, because he's nothing like the Quinlan Voss that we knew. Okay. Or Greedo. We said Greedo. We're not even going to touch the Greedo thing. Um, let's see. Luke Van Horn asks, what are your favorite sorts of items to summarize for the timeline gold? Uh, which is not necessarily the same thing as your favorite items to read. And similarly, which sorts of items do you most dislike summarizing and why for both? Hmm. So I think my favorites would have to be either stories that are very straightforward and easy to summarize so I can do it quickly, right? So in a lot of cases, the comics or, say, an episode of Rebels, something like that. Um, or something that is very complex that I realize I'm going to be helping a lot of people by actually putting it in there in chronological context that actually has clear answers to when things take place. Like, for instance, um, if you want to go with Legends, something like Darth Plagueis. Pain in the butt, lots of pieces. I know I was helping people, and where the pieces fit was relatively clear. Um, same thing with Rebel Rising for Story Group Canon, or Lost Stars for Story Group Canon. Um, as opposed to something like a Phasma or a Thrawn that have me wanting to pull my hair out because there is no specificity involved. Uh, let's see, uh, sorts of things I most dislike summarizing. I'm going to go back to the Thrawn and Phasma kind of thing. Um, if it's a story I didn't particularly enjoy in the first place, like, say, Phasma, that's a slog to get through to summarize. Um, or if I know that a story is easy to summarize, but it's not going to matter, nobody's going to care about it because the story was completely useless, um, that kind of thing just kind of sucks to summarize because I know I need to do it, but nah. Um, but I would say something that's like a Thrawn or a Phasma in the sense that there's no specificity, very complex, lots of great info, but where the heck do you put it? Or something that requires a lot of watch and summarize, watch and summarize. And I don't mean like Rebels, I mean something like um, the tediousness, is that the right word? The tediousness of summarizing something from the Old Republic MMO. To do that, because I don't play it, and if I did, I wouldn't be playing with every single class through every single story, requires me to find decent live streams of it, uh, videos of it, and watch through them all. You would not believe how many hours and hours and days worth of time, probably weeks worth of time, I spent doing nothing but watching live streams of the original class storylines for the original Old Republic before there were any um, any expansions. It's just, it's tedious as hell. Um, it's good to have on there. People ask for it. I'd like to get more of it on there. I plan to for the next edition, but God, it's tedious. Um, but that's the only way to get the information if I'm not playing it. Uh, let's see. Then Chris Jones, last, uh, last person asking questions here, asks three. What has been the most difficult item to place in the timeline? What item has had to be moved around the most, and both in the EU and the new canon? So he's kind of asking the two questions, I guess, with that last one sort of informing what the first two are about there. So um, most difficult item to place, uh, Thrawn, as far as the new one goes. Um, and I think that's the main one at this point, um, unless we're talking about the impossible the impossible is taking Clone Wars before 2008, Clone Wars once the TV series started, and integrating them. That, I feel like, is an absolutely impossible task to do in any way that's going to make logical sense anymore. Um, especially given how long the Clone Wars span. You can't even do the old part of the waters right around the time Anakin is knighted and gets his scar thing and just plop everything in the middle again, because that now doesn't work. Um, for Legends, I mean. So... If we're not counting that, which is impossible, then I would say basically um, probably Thrawn. Because even Timothy Zahn, when he was talking to, I believe it was Rob Mullen, I don't know if it was Rob that asked or if Rob found this information out, I forget. Um, but when asked when Thrawn starts, Zahn gave an answer that didn't even fit what the frickin' book's internal timeline said. The book's internal timeline says that it's between Tarkin and uh, A New Dawn, which means... Uh, 14 to 11 BBY, somewhere in there is when it must start. And Zahn's answer was, well, it's one or two years after the Clone Wars. That doesn't fit what the 
book says. So, yes. Thrawn, probably. I enjoyed the book, but... <sighs> um, they need to start pinning shit now. Um, let's see. Uh, had to be moved around the most. Hmm. Um... That's mostly stuff where they change when they say something takes place. Um, so I would say probably the main one, and I can't think of any offhand for Legends. I know it's happened, but I can't think of any examples offhand unless we're talking about something that, you know, like where they were wishy-washy on pinning down exactly how long after the Battle of Yavin the uh, evacuation of Yavin was. But I would say that for... Um, Story Group Canon, I would say it's the uh, Adventures in Wild Space series. Because Adventures in Wild Space includes an infant Ezra Bridger. But then they decided, oh, we're actually going to make it take place later than we originally said it was going to take place, so we're going to scoot it. So now, he's not really an infant. Just assume every time they talk about him as an infant, he's actually more like a toddler or something. And it wound up requiring every story in Adventures in Wild Space and every date reference from it to move around on the timeline. Um, but it's only happened really once. Um, I mean, there are other things that get shifted, but off the... T I mean, like uh, The Old Republic was another one, where we originally had a span of years that The Old Republic MMO was supposed to take place, and then they changed it thanks to the uh, Old Republic uh, encyclopedia, that basically all of the Old Republic that we had seen up to that point all takes place in one year, not spread out over three. So all that stuff had to be condensed and crammed and doesn't really make a whole lot of sense in one year and affected comics and affected novels and stuff around it. Um, that sort of thing. Um, it doesn't happen as often, frankly, as you would think, though. Um, I imagine it's going to happen more and more with the new story group canon, though, because as they start having to pin things down, even if it's not pinning down exactly when something happens, like... Hey, the Lando comic. When does a Lando comic take place? Between A New Hope and Empire? Great. So when does it take place? Um, at some point, they're going to have to start pinning down when, say, the Lando comic takes place in relation to Lando in something else, perhaps. Which one comes first? Even if it's not which year of the three is it in? Um, and as they do that, there'll probably be some shuffling around that'll have to happen. And if they start doing that more often, there will have to be more shuffling. So uh, I imagine with, in terms of shuffling, we probably ain't seen nothing yet. It's all going to come down to when they finally start pinning stuff down and realize that being vague all the time is a recipe for disaster. In my opinion, right? Or I guess I should say, and of course that's just my opinion, I could be wrong. You know, because now I'm able to actually watch old Dennis Miller lives uh, from time to time. So that was your questions, or those were your questions, as submitted uh, on Facebook on a post that I made asking for questions if I were to do a Q&A video. I have now. If you have other questions about the Star Wars Timeline Gold, feel free to drop them into the comments for this video, either on Facebook, where it will be for once, uh, or on YouTube. I'll gather them up at some point for another Q&A, or I'll gather them and just add them to a regular YouTube vlog Q&A. just kind of depends uh, on exactly how many there are relative to questions about other things uh, posted underneath the last regular Q&A for the vlog. Again, though, thank you for your interest. Again, check out the Star Wars Timeline Gold number 55 at over 3,200 pages just released for 2017 over at StarWarsFanWars.com slash timeline. And don't forget, you can pick up a saga on home video over on Amazon. Uh, my Patreon has also launched today, patreon.com slash Nathan P. Butler. If you're interested in perhaps uh, taking part in the Patreon process, getting some exclusive content, you'll also find information there if you're interested on how to acquire a signed copy of the book. Thank you all for watching. May the Force be with you. See you next time for The Voice of Reason or Lack Thereof.